and good morning. It's good to have all of you who are in the room with us today, and it's good to have our folks uh, that are joining us online. Uh, remember, uh, we love having you here in person, but I know a lot of you are traveling uh, this fall, uh, and uh, we strive every Sunday at 9 o'clock uh, to, to broadcast this service live. Uh, and uh, if you want to find us, the easiest way is just simply to go to the church webpage, and you can do that. Uh, you know, I've, uh, I've listened to the service when I was on the West Coast visiting family, and uh, they, uh, they sent me out to get groceries. And so I know that it works on Highway 1 uh, as you're weaving, weaving down the road on the way to the supermarket. Uh, so you can join us anywhere, and uh, we're really happy uh, to have you do that. We have a lot of things coming up, and we're pretty excited about them. Uh, there is, um, it's just, um, it's really exciting to watch uh, uh, old ministries become new again. Uh, and uh, it's, today is uh, the comeback uh, for the high school Bible study. Uh, it's Sundays at 1.10, which is specifically designed so you can grab a donut or today a, a piece of cake today. Uh, and it's for grades 10 to 12, so we invite you to come. Next Sunday is Reformation Sunday. Uh, and uh, uh, we are celebrating uh, the anniversary of, of the Reformation, and the gift it was to the whole church, not just the Lutherans. Uh, and uh, so in honor of that, we encourage you to wear something red, uh, because red is the traditional country, uh, color of the Reformation. Uh, though I know some of you are planning on coming as Klingons. <laughs> they, they're, that's a deep part of the Reformation that we don't like to talk about. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, and then also, uh, All Saints is the next Sunday after that, and it's time for us uh, to remember our memorial cards, uh, those that we have lost. Uh, and uh, it doesn't have to be somebody from this last year, especially since uh, last year at this time we weren't really able to do this type of service. So remember those that you have lost. Uh, now I have a, a uh, you know I'm serious when I actually read an announcement, but this is good news and I, I don't want to get it wrong. Uh, this is about our, uh, our sisters and brothers at Moon Valley Church, which most of you remember, they, they lost their roof. Uh, it, it caved out across the street uh, and that uh, next Sunday, uh, they started worshiping at our location, and they've been here uh, every Saturday night since then. Uh, and uh, let me just read this, though. Although we originally welcomed Moon Valley Bible Church to use our facility without any expectation of reimbursement, they have approached us asking for an invoice. Now, it doesn't you I say asking for, I would say pestering us uh, for an invoice. They really wanted to pay us something. They have learned that their insurance covers the cost of temporary replacement facilities and want us to benefit from it. So the executive committee and the council discussed the situation in detail and decided that the best use of these unexpected funds would be to apply them towards the expense of the facility. Specifically, uh, we want to pay down our mortgage uh, with that money. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, I have never seen a group of people work so hard not to receive money. We had to get assurances from them that this wasn't going to in any way uh, be a, a, like a, a cold fish between us, uh, that, that we would feel like there wasn't as much love and welcome as, as the Lord has given us in this time. They said, no, we, you know, we, uh, we paid these premiums. We want you uh, to benefit from that. So uh, we're just, when you see those folks, be sure uh, to thank them for their generosity to us, uh, and uh, certainly they have been wonderful neighbors for us to share our house with. We are in our stewardship season, uh, and this year's themes are, is gift, which is, uh, what do you call that when letters mean something? Yes, it's that thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, it means growing in faith together, growing in faith together. Uh, and uh, we've been having different speakers, uh, and I, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome forward Kristen Williams, who's going to be sharing with you.
Good morning. So I received a phone call a few weeks ago asking if I would be willing to speak and talk about stewardship, and I thought, why would I be the person asked to do that? <laughs> I have no idea. But I thought about it some, and I remember as a kid in church, every year somebody would get up and talk about stewardship, and they would talk about making certain we would give of our time and our talent and our treasure. And my parents sat me down and talked to us about the fact that even though we were children, we could be stewards of our time, our talent, and our treasure. And so even though stewardship for a lot of people focuses on money, um, and obviously that's a very important part of our stewardship campaign, I want to take a moment to remember that we have gifts given to us by our Heavenly Father through the Holy Spirit that are not just treasure. We have gifts that we can offer each other, our families here at church, people outside of our church. When I was in high school, I took a uh, spiritual gifts class, so to speak, and we did an inventory of our gifts. And some of the things that came out of that inventory were surprising to me in high school. I was going, leadership? No, I'm the kid that sits in the back of the room. Um, other things that came out of that, hospitality. And I went, oh, I don't know that I'm hospitable, but apparently I am. Um, <laughs> and now I see it. I love hosting people in my home. I love being able to greet people with a warm smile. Being here at All Saints has been wonderful. We've been here since July of 2018. We came looking for a home, a church home, that would have a great confirmation program. And that was, as our oldest was reaching confirmation age, and it became really important that we have a really wonderful, solid base for her. And All Saints has offered that. Not only has it offered that, it is offered to us as a family places to share our gifts. I, sh I have shared gifts of music with the congregation. I've now been able to share leadership gifts with, uh, by participating on the strategic planning committee, um, I, or the, the task force specifically, not a committee. Um, my husband has been able to participate in shepherding high school. In fact, he's gonna be a shepherd in the high school Bible study starting this morning. Um, my kids have been able to share their gifts in music and leadership and through confirmation, through Sunday school, et cetera. So I just would like to remind everybody to look in their hearts and what, what brings you joy? Because oftentimes those things that bring you joy are your gifts to share with others. And most importantly, I also think it's important that we remember to receive the gifts that others have for us. We all have many different talents, gifts to share. And I just hope that through this season, as people look into their hearts and figure out how they can share their time, their talent, and their treasure, that you also take a moment to think about what gifts you are receiving from those around you and be grateful. And that gratitude, as you offer gratitude for it, that in itself is a gift. Thank you. Worship service, uh, and uh, uh, before we do that, uh, this is my chance uh, to introduce our, our guest for the day, Pastor Miguel Gomez Acosta. Uh, Miguel's back in the back over there, so you can turn around and wave at him. I was trying to think of how to describe his work. Uh, he works in, for the Synod in the bishop's office, uh, and his title, I guess, I, I, I don't remember your title. Uh, Tell us later. All right. But, but this is how I see his job, and the easy way to remember him uh, is he's the Indiana Jones of the Senate, okay? Uh, he travels around, and he's all these places, uh, and sometimes what he's doing is he's, he's finding these treasures uh, that are scattered all around our community. He's uncovering them. He's lifting them up. He's saving them and sharing them with others. Uh, and he, I've been watching him do this work uh, for the last five years, and he is a person uh, that notices the true value of things 
uh, that others have forgotten. Uh, and uh, uh, we, it is an honor for us to have him in worship with us today. With that, let us stand together and begin by confession of our sins. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God full of compassion and mercy, abounding in steadfast love. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. To you, O God, all hearts are open. To you, all desires are known. We come to you confessing our sins. Forgive us in your mercy and remember us in your love. Show us your ways, teach us your paths, and lead us in justice and truth. For the sake of your goodness, in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on us. By water and the Holy Spirit, God gives us a new birth. And through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God forgives you all your sins. The God of mercy and might strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. We'll join in hymn 779, Amazing Grace.
Let us pray. Eternal light, shine in our hearts. Eternal wisdom, scatter the darkness of our ignorance. Eternal compassion, have mercy on us. Turn us to seek your face. Enable us to reflect your goodness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from Hebrew 7, 23 through 28. Furthermore, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it is fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above all the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. This he did once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests those who are subject to weakness, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. We'll join in hymn 174, the Celtic Alleluia. Please rise. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprung up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he gained his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Congregation, please be seated. Grace and peace to you from God the Creator, God the Redeemer, God the Reconciler. Amen. What a joy to be with you here this morning. And actually, I had forgotten, Pastor Dan, that this you are in the stewardship season. Uh, and therefore, the, I am so pleased with your theme, Growing in Faith 
together. That is great. That, I am very <laughs> pleased by that theme, by the way. I give you kudos and stars for that. Uh, that's pretty awesome. Um, that said, I want to. Uh, I am Pastor Miguel Gomez Acosta. I am the director for Evangelical Mission and Bishops Associate for Congregational Vitality, which is a really long title to just say I am the mission guy. Okay, <laughs> anything that has to do with missions is me. I'm the one that takes care of that, and actually, I, I lead that 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 group, and I I have conversations and consultations with congregations regarding stewardship and uh, uh, and missions, and so I'm really excited. Uh, to be here with you. I bring you greetings on behalf uh, of our bishop, Bishop Deborah Hutter, uh, the bishop of the Grand Canyon Synod, who, like uh, my other colleagues who are part of the Synod office, are scattered and about today uh, through the four corners of our Synod. Uh, that if you don't know where our Synod is, it is the whole state of Arizona, plus southern Utah and southern Nevada. And so we're really excited that we get to go into our congregations and remind us that we are, in fact, church together. Uh, and so actually, I think today, though, I think Bishop is doing an a ordination of a pastor who's coming into a territory in Illinois. So she's actually around the Chicago area, Chicago land, doing, an, uh, she just did the ordination yesterday, and they're coming back this, uh, on Monday uh, back to our territory with a newly ordained pastor who will be serving a congregation down in Tucson. So we're really excited to welcome that pastor uh, into our midst and into our fellowship. I also bring you uh, greetings on behalf of the presiding bishop of the ELCA, uh, Bishop Elizabeth Eden, who every time we gather together, she is specialist as directors for evangelical mission, which there's 65 of us. So if there's 65 of us and there's one per synod, how many synods do we have? 65, right? That's, that's called the, the old math. New math, not so much. It's hard to, to figure it out. But old math, it's 65 because you just add it up, right? So you multiply it, and so there you go. So 65. 65 synods throughout uh, the country that make up the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. One of the things that Bishop Eden wanted, well, at one point when I first started five years ago in my position, she wanted to remind us as a synod, I mean as directors for Evangelical Mission, that when we went back to our territories, uh, she wanted us to remember to bring a message specifically from her to you as a congregation of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. And this is it. We as the ELCA are four things. Number one, we as the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America are church. We are church. And that is, has to be very clearly indicated that we're not a social club. We're not a nonprofit organization. We're not an NGO. Uh, and, and we're not, you know, a fraternal organization that, you know, that we have a club and everybody just shows up and has membership. No, that's not who we are. We are church, which means that we have a purpose for being. One, to glorify God and everything that God does. And second, to also uh, 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 make sure that we make disciples of all nations. So therefore, we are church. Second, Bishop Eden reminds, wants to remind you, is that we are Lutheran. We are Lutheran, and that's very important for us to remember because we hold to certain traditions and confessions that, very clear, that make very clear that we're actually Lutheran. And I know that you do have one of your pastors who is a PCUSA pastor, and that's great, and we are in fellowship with them, but we happen to be ELCA Lutherans, right? And so as Lutherans, we need to celebrate that and not look down on that as if that's something wrong with us. But instead, in the whole body of Christ, as we look at Christendom, and all the churches that make up, you know, Christ's body in the world, we just happen to be the left pinky, right? And here is left pinky, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. We just, uh, we're, we're Lutherans, right? And here we are. Third, Bishop Eden wants to remind you that we are church together. We are church together, which means that we are not alone. We are not silos onto ourselves, but you are part of something greater, right? Obviously, you're part of the Grand Canyon Synod. And the ministry that's happening here today, this morning at All Saints, is the same ministry that's happening at my home congregation in Chandler, Arizona, uh, which is Holy Trinity, as well as the ministry that's happening this morning at the newly opened coffee shop called The Station Coffee Company in Florence, Arizona, which will be a community center for the people of Florence, as well as a place where they can grant money to different organizations there. But it is also, technically speaking, a worshiping community, because as they grow, they're going to be having worship at that coffee shop on Sunday mornings. And that is one of your ministries. You are part of that. Did you know that? And as being a part of that, so we are church together, which also means that when we as a church together, and as we grow in faith together, we pull together our resources, each congregation sending their mission support so that we can do such work. 
right? So that we can be together and to share the gospel in the areas where, you know, we feel that, that, that we are being called to. And so you are a part of that. And thank you so much for your mission support. Thank you so much for your gifts that you give to your congregation that they, they in turn share with us, that we in turn then share with the national church. Because as being church together, did you know that as the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, you're also part of a global movement called the Lutheran World Federation? 193 Lutheran bodies from all over the world that make up this organization that together we come together as a community and a fellowship of 193 congregations, I mean 193 uh, church bodies from all over the world in order for us to express our faith and our identity throughout the world. And so we are also part of something much greater. So we are church uh, together. And number four, and for me as the mission guy in the Senate, the most important, we are church for the sake of the world. We are church for the sake of the world, which means that I hate to say this, but church does not exist for the people inside of these four walls. And that is a sad thing because we need to be reminded that church does not exist neither for you nor for me. On the contrary, we exist for those who are outside of these doors. Why? Because you and I come every week to this place, broken, sinful, in need of redeeming of Christ's spirit, and grace, and mercy. And we come to this place and we are nourished and fed through word and sacrament, but not so that we may get you know, better ourselves, but instead so that we may be nourished for our work outside of these doors, for our engagement with the world, for telling others about Jesus, for being engaged out there. That is our purpose as church, and that's what Bishop Eden wants to remind all of our congregations throughout the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. We are church, we are Lutheran, we are church together, we are church for the sake of the world. So with that, thank you once again for the opportunity to be here. I was just telling Pastor Dan, he was actually very surprised that I have never preached here. Um, I visited, I think of one time, when you had an intern that was here, but uh, I visited that one time, but I actually have never, and we've also had synod events here, but I've never preached in this congregation, so thank you for the privilege to be able to share the word with you this morning. Before I was the, the, the mission guy for the Synod, I actually was a parish pastor in, uh, in Mesa. And in the congregation that I was serving, I was senior pastor of First Evangelical Lutheran uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the west side of Mesa, which is the older part of Mesa. This congregation was one of the first congregations on the east side of the Phoenix area. Uh, as the uh, Lutheranism began to grow about 120 uh, years ago, uh, it all kind of kind of focused around the Phoenix area, and then it would started expanding out. But the, in the east side, uh, First Evangelical was the very first east side Lutheran congregation, ergo First Evangelical, right? Uh, church that's there. Uh, and so, and it has a rich history of being present in and, and, and the way that they, they started their congregation in 1940. Uh, six and with 32 families, uh, a diaspora amongst a sea of LDS community, right? Because that's exactly what Mesa was at that time. And so they fought hard to make sure that they, as 32 families, kind of huddled together for support and being you know, outsiders in this community around uh, uh, all their uh, L LDS neighbors, uh, they became a group and they became a church and they grew. And by the grace of God, uh, they, they did a wonderful ministry. But they got to a point, uh, way before I got there, where obviously, like many congregations that are that old, uh, began to, uh, to die down. And so things began to slow down. The 70s and 80s were wonderful for First Evangelical. I mean, they had, at one point, they had so many kids in Sunday school, they actually had to have a Sunday school superintendent. Can you imagine that? A Sunday school superintendent with 100 children in Sunday school every single Sunday. But that was the awesomeness of being church back in the 70s and 80s. But as the 90s rolled around, things slowed down. As society and community began to look at priorities, especially family priorities in different perspectives, sports started taking more, more priorities for young families. You, uh, young families started coming less and less to church. Kids went to Sunday school and maybe confirmation, but you never see them again, and so on and so forth. So there was nothing that they did wrong that they began to die down. But as they begin to die down, they got to a point where they, I don't know if it was a, a matter of desperation, what I really think is that it was the right time at the right place. 
because Pastor John Schomburg, actually my predecessor, he eventually became the director for evangelical mission as well. When he retired, I took over for him. But when he returned back, as he was a son of that congregation, when he returned back 30 years after he'd been away to take over that congregation, he began to see that something needed to happen. And he began to ask the question, God, what do you want us to do? What is it, the direction you would like us to take? Open our eyes, Lord, so that we may see where you are calling us. And as he began to ask that question, he encouraged his leadership. And at one point, he got to a, a place where he says, look, during our Lenten journey, during our Lenten journey, these 40 days, we will have one task and one task only. Every day, the leadership will gather and we will pray. God, open our eyes, open our hearts to know and see where you want us to lead, where you're leading us and what our next step is because we are at a place where I think we're a bit lost. And sure enough, that Lenten discipline, they gathered every day for those 40 days praying, Lord, guide us, lead us, and you know, what is the next step? Open our eyes so that we may see where you want us to be. Interestingly enough, after the 40 this and the 41st day, after they had done all this prayer and discernment and trying to figure out where God was calling to next, all of a sudden, Pastor John gets a knock on his door. At, well, they come to the office door, and he opens the door, and it's Head Start, asking a question. He's like, look, we're out on the community, and this community, which, by the way, had drastically changed when, since First Evangelical first started. You see, when First Evangelical first started, it was predominantly uh, an English-speaking community, and, and Anglos lived all over the place. But, of course, with flight and people going out and farther out east than Mesa, and people just the abandoned houses, and there was less people there. And so then um, uh, 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 more Latinos started moving in uh, to that neighborhood, and it, the, the, the community drastically changed. And even changed even when I was there, because it went from Latino to African American, and so on and so forth. So there's so much change happening in this community. And as they, they, that, that day, the, the Head Start director comes over and says, we're looking for a spot to do ministry and to do it here. And so is it possible for us to do it here? And Pastor John was like, God, is this you showing us the way? Is this what we've been asking for this entire time? So he says, well, there's only one way to find out, right? Okay. And so he says, yes. And he just gets the contract and literally signs it that day. The next day, a, um, an American Catholic community that was a Spanish-speaking community comes to him and says, look, we, we're here, we're in this neighborhood, we have some members, and we would like to start a Spanish-speaking ministry in this place. Do you, if you have one, we don't want to get in the way. And Pastor John's like, we know in full well that this neighborhood is completely different than what it used to be. What does he say? Okay. <laughs> but then the next day, they started again, and so on and so forth to the point where that place became the place of third, uh, the ministry of third place. The place where community gathers, where people come to that place, not because they come to worship, but because it is a place where the community knows that they are safe, and this is a place that cares for them, right? And by the time I got there as their bilingual pastor, I also not only was a bilingual pastor, but I also had started a Spanish-speaking community at another spot, another place in Mesa, and so I brought that community over, and we started, and they eventually merged to become First Evangelical La Primera, a bilingual community with a bilingual pastor serving that community to this day. Did they grow in numbers? Did they go back to the 100 kids in Sunday school? No. But are they living their best life, as the kids say nowadays? Are they actually engaged in ministry, engaged what God has called them to? Yes. Because that place now has a, a, a Lutheran charter school called Concordia Charter, which is made up of 98% Latino children. And I know this because my wife works there. <laughs> she works, she still works there, right? I left eventually, but then she stayed, she stayed behind and still works there. And that community serve, and that church serves that community so faithfully and has done so for the last, uh, uh, what's it, 20, uh, 25 years since they asked that question, Lord, open our eyes, teach us, and show us the way. Where are we supposed to go from here? And by the grace of God, they responded, and they saw what God, what God was, what was providing for them. It, they became that place of third, that ministry of third place where people gather as community. I remember when I was uh, the senior pastor there, 
I would have neighbors. We, we, at one point, we also have a, had a food bank, and, and uh, uh, I would have people that, that um, the, used to, the language was to call them clients, the people that would come to the food bank. And I said, we're done with that business. From now on, we're referred to them as our neighbors, because that's exactly what they are. So we will not, they're not our clients, they're our neighbors. And when we say neighbors, that means relationship, right? Because it's no longer about, uh, I know, here I'm serving you and stay away, but instead it's like, now let me, I want to know you. And it got to a point where people began to say, this is my church, even though they weren't even Lutheran. But that was what that place became. That is what it represented for them, the place where they knew that, God, they, that people cared for them and they knew that they could come here to express their, 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 their concerns and be together. I remember at one point, the, the, I, I, sorry to mention it this way, but I call them my, my little old ladies that used to work the food bank, um, that were faithful uh, uh, um, uh, uh, servants, and they just faithfully served the food bank every, for about uh, 15 years. And I knew that we had made a huge transition from clients to neighbors, and the relationships were beginning to, to emerge when uh, one of the ladies came, and, and she the, 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 the would receive uh, food from the food bank, and she would call me mijo, which if you don't know what that is in Spanish, is my little son. And so mijito, so that, because even though I was a pastor, she still uh, she was older than me. So, but I saw that she was sad, and I'm like, Ruby, what's wrong? And so Ruby, because I was I would work out there with them and, and, and just interact with community. And he says, Oh, mijo, they they have told me once again. Says that that the cancer is back. This is the third time. And my family and I have chosen. I decided that I'm not going to fight anymore. Mijo, it's it's my time. And so I'm just, I'm tired. And I said, Ruby, I am so sad about that. And that was, it was really, really sad. I mean, I had known this person now for 10 years. And so I, I, I went back, I was crying, and I went back to the, my little old ladies, and I'm like, ladies, Ruby just told me the worst news. She said, what's that? It's like that her cancer is back, and she is not going to seek treatment. This is it. She might be going into hospice later. And they were shocked, and they said, Pastor, can we pray for her? And I'm like, okay, this is the first. And so I said, Ruby, come in. So the ladies want to pray for you. Okay, so we went into the sanctuary, and they laid hands on her, and we prayed with Ruby for 15 minutes. Forget the ministry that was happening outside. Everything else was not important because at that moment, our priority was Ruby. We cried with her, we embraced her, and everything was all about Ruby and her pain. Two years later, I heard news that Ruby had passed. So I went to the ladies and I said, ladies, the day has come. Ruby is no longer with us, which is why she, because they asked me why, we haven't seen Ruby, so I made some phone calls and I, and I figured out what happened. Well, Ruby had passed away and they cried. They cried because she was no longer a stranger, but she was their neighbor. She was their friend. She was their sister. Was Ruby Lutheran? No. Was Ruby a child of God? Yes. And they became so close to her that they mourned. And we actually had a little mini service for her, but the rest of the, the, the food bank community to lift up our friend Ruby. When was the last time you asked God, show me, open my eyes? Where do you want me to be? What do you want me to do? What is my next step? Today in our gospel lesson, we hear a blind man that just would not give up. He knew where his answers would lie. He knew where he could get healing, and that was with Jesus. He did not give up, even though there was obstacles. People saying, be quiet, silence, but no, Lord, Master, show me, heal me. And he would not give up, but consistently went back to God over and over again until he would get an answer. Just like First Evangelical did for those 40 days. Lord, show us the way. Open our eyes. Where are we supposed to be? Not giving up, but consistently asking until an answer was given. And the blind man was told, he says, um, uh, the, the gospel lesson to us, and like I said, look, he's calling you right? He's calling you. So he goes and he, the, he walks over and they guide him to him. Then he's able to, then he says, what do you want from me? Master, open my eyes so that I may see again. Open my eyes. A simple request, open my eyes. And our gospel lesson says that immediately, it says your faith has healed you and he sees once again and follows Jesus. 
When was the last time that all saints asked the question or pleaded with God, God, open our eyes so that we may see again, so that we may see our neighbor, so that we may see the rubies in our community, so that we may see those who are in pain and in need of your love, so that we may be your light in their life. You have gifts, not just God growing in faith together, but those gifts that our sister just brought up today uh, in her temple talk. And those gifts could be used for the gospel. Those gifts could be used for the growth of the kingdom of God, whether it be your financial gifts, whether it be your gifts of talents, or whether it be your gift of time. And we, you as a congregation, and I say we because I am part of you just like you are part of me. We can make a difference in our communities because we are the light of Christ in this place. You have been called here for a purpose and you've been given gifts for a purpose and that is to grow the kingdom of God and to be Christ's representatives on this earth. May the Lord bless you and keep you and be with you always. Amen. Join in hymn number 612. Please rise. <clears throat>
before we uh, move on with our worship and go to the Apostles' Creed, I want you to know that our confirmation youth are in our eighth grade class are beginning to study the Apostles' Creed. Uh, and this creed has lots of meanings and lots of purposes. But sometimes it is simply a reminder for us of what is truly important in our life. So let us, as people of God, confess our faith. People of God, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to be seated for our prayers. Claimed by Christ and filled with God's grace and hope, let us offer our prayers for the world, the church, and for all people according to their needs. Let us pray that the church may always be ready to follow the example of Jesus by showing mercy and charity to others. Hear us, O oh God. Your grace It is our honor, Lord, to pray for the affirm, the aging, the suffering, and the dying. We ask your blessings now upon Caitlin Homeland, Ron Schultz, Fern and Randy, Jerry Olson, Tina Huff, Christy Heffelfinger, Regan Heffelfinger, Jack Heffelfinger, Kent Mangus, Linda Orlando, Teresa Nigro, Alan Johnson, Don Noller, Shirley Baltouche, our sister Marita Fink, Joyce Tesdall, Max Woolman, and George Humphrey. Hear us, O God. Your grace Let us pray for that call to ministry within this congregation, that guided by the Spirit, we would seek to serve as ambassadors of your grace and bless the holy work we do together throughout our Grand Canyon Synod and our National Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Hear us, O oh God. Your grace above. Pray in thanksgiving for all who have died in the peace of Jesus. Bless now George Heist and family on the death of his wife, Laura. Bless Keeley Cole and family on the death of Keeley's mom, Shay Riley. Bless, bless Dominic and Muriel Blanchard on the loss of their little boy, John, who was born five months along in the pregnancy. Bless Steve Arlino and family on the death of his cousin Linda due to COVID complications. Hear us, O oh God. Your grace holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, hear these petitions of your faithful people as we present them before your heavenly throne of your glory. And by your grace, grant us these things that the sea that we need for the sake of our sovereign Redeemer, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you to remain seated, but turn around and uh, wave the peace of the Lord to your neighbors. God's peace.
Just a reminder, uh, as we uh, continue now with worship, uh, if you didn't pick up one of these packets on the entranceway uh, as you came in, you can sneak out right now. You will have time to grab one. Uh, later on in the service, I'll invite you to open them. But for now, just make sure that you have one. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is our right to give God thanks and praise. It is our duty and delight that we should everywhere and always offer thanks and praise to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, who by his death on the cross and glorious resurrection broke the bonds of sin and death and gave life to all creation. And so with the church on earth, all creation, the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, full of your glory, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took a cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, time I invite you to first to, to remove the bread and hold it up as we'll take it together. <laughs> this is the body of Christ given for you.
This is the blood of Christ that we share together. Join in hymn number 496. Today is an extra special day for us uh, because uh, there has been a ministry among us uh, that we are so grateful for. It's an ongoing ministry to our seniors. Uh, but there was a woman uh, who uh, not only gave uh, her time uh, and her intelligence, but gave her heart uh, to care for our seniors. Uh, and uh, we are so excited today uh, to celebrate all the amazing work that she has done for us over the decades. She started when she was 16, um, <laughs> and therefore can have an early retirement. Um, we're going to start off with a video that she has made for us. Hi, everybody. Thanks for helping me celebrate my retirement today. Thinking back over the years of working at All Saints, I realized how very much I have to be thankful for and how many wonderful blessings I have received. I started working for the church, I think in late 1999, as a part-time receptionist in the office. Then I became the full-time secretary for a, for a while. 
and uh, about 2003, the senior ministry position was created and that became my primary responsibility. The original team back in those days was Urban Peggy Schutze, Bob and Bonnie Escher, and LaDonna Ashmore. Bonnie and LaDonna each served almost 20 years each. At first, the team felt like a deer in the headlights as we forged into the unknown territory of ministry for older adults. Fortunately, we were blessed with the leadership of pastors and councils that gave us the creative freedom to try new ideas and to not beat us up if we had a flop. We might have had a flop or two. The team was incredibly dedicated and hardworking. We learned as we went along and had fun together as the ministry exp expanded. Over the years, there were many supportive souls who served on the team and a small army of volunteers who made it all happen. I'm so sorry there are too many people to name, but I do remember their efforts and I truly appreciate them. I would also like to express my appreciation for the support and friendship of the staff over these many years. Although our individual skills are distinct and very diverse, we have always been open to sharing ideas, insights, and resources. One could usually expect that, that an urgent cry for assistance would be answered with helping hands or the required guidance. In fact, I may never know how many times Sherry Clark or Christy Worsig saved me from some calamity or talked me out of a less than stellar idea. I'll be forever grateful for the kindnesses extended to me by my coworkers. And you all, all the saints, must also be acknowledged. I'm so very thankful for the many times you offered kind words and support and generously shared your ideas, resources, and financial gifts. Your support was always a boon to my spirit and helped to sustain me. Of course, the most beloved part of the job was simply being present in the lives of elders. They invited me into their homes and welcomed me into their families. They loved me, they tolerated me, they nurtured me, and they gave me joy. They shared their amazing stories of hardship and forbearance and their lifelong experiences of love and loss. I was so honored to be invited into those lives. There's no feeling like the warm glow I felt after, after visiting them. The loving smiles on the faces of so many saints are indelibly etched in my memory, and that is the most precious blessing. Thanks be to God, and thanks be to all of you. I'm going to invite Marita to come forward, as well as those who will be uh, presenting with her. Go ahead. We present this cross to Marita. <laughs> Just lean forward. We present the cross to Marita. Don't. <laughs> um, it might help to put glasses on. Sorry, guys. <laughs> the cross was made by Linda Young, and the plaque was made by D Damien Speck to hold the special cross. Christy will read the meaning of the cross. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Created especially for Marita Fink, this fused glass cross holds much symbolism. The brown and black first layer made from the ends of hand rolled sheets of glass and chosen for their uniqueness of shape speaks to the imperfect, possibly 
hurriedly assembled cross upon which Christ's blood, symbolized by the red vertical stripe, was spilled for us. That sacrifice of Christ's love then gave way to new and vibrant life as depicted by the green glass over the crossbar, everlasting life, life never ending. Curled copper wire at the center of the cross is a reminder of Christ's words, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. So then your cross will hang here. Nice. That's a bit of Damien. Mm-hmm. And of course, we uh, can't send her off without a quilt. <laughs> Marita, I'm going to let you have the last words if you have any, but okay. the, this is a certificate uh, that the only is a, a small scratch of how deeply you are embedded into all of our hearts. Uh, and I'll, I'll speak for myself. Um, in other places, uh, we have done, done senior ministry before, and it's been a pleasure to do that. But I realized this was the big league year, uh, when your ability not only to care for the members of our church, but to especially uh, to find those that the rest of the people had forgotten uh, and help them. And uh, I don't know how many strays you picked up on the way um, <laughs> and you love them as your own family and uh, you gave them peace at the last. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to be really quick, but um, the receiving of the quilt fits in so well with the theme of today and how we are church within and without. I think you all know it by now, but the cut-ups group is a perfect example of how we are church outside of the walls and in the community. That group invites their friends, their neighbors, their relatives, so people from other churches, men, women, come and work up in the fellowship hall. And they're so productive with all these beautiful things that go not only to our members, but out. Lutheran, to Lutheran World Relief, they've gone all over the world, and many, many hundreds of things to our community and hospitals and senior living places and hospice places. But for Pastor Gomez Acosta, I have a first person story for you to take to your bishops. <laughs> bishop Hutter and Bishop Eaton, I love them both. Um, the most personal part of these prayer chains is when they're signed by the congregation, excuse me. But I want to explain to Pastor Acosta the ripple effect of those signatures I've delivered many of these quilts in many different places, hospitals, care homes, hospice, senior living places. The family sees it, the recipient sees it, but also all the workers, the caregivers, anybody around, even those hearts you signed for me on Valentine's of 2019, that full box of hearts. I was still in the hospital. I showed them to everybody that came in the room and for them to see and experience the witness of how we are church together, but outside of the walls. People were, are so, so moved when they see all these signatures of a, a church together that, that spreads their love out and reflects their love of God. So this is one of our church's biggest, biggest ministries, I feel, that these, these items go out into the community that's all. Thanks for, excuse the squealing. Me. 
for our blessing. Let us bless the Before we go, I want to invite you all up to the fellowship hall. Uh, we'll have cake up there, uh, and there'll be, we'll pass around the microphone. Uh, if you have words of gratitude or a wonderful memory to share, you'll have a chance to do that. Go in peace. The living word dwells in you. Thanks be to God. Good. good.